Welcome to Rome. This is The Bittersweet Life with Katie Sewell and Tiffany Parks. Hello, this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. Tiffany is away this week, but I am joined by Marty Buckley. She's an author, cook, and journalist living in San Sebastian, Spain. Her award-winning book is called Basque Country, and her second book, The Pincho Book, will be coming out the spring of 2024. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you on. Uh, we were joking before we got started that the Basque Country book, which is sitting right here in front of me and from which I've made some of your recipes, came out in 2018. And you and I have been <laughs> trying to find a time to have you on the show since then. I blame myself largely. I don't think this is your fault. <laughs> you, can blame, you can blame the pandemic. Yeah, that too. <laughs> but yes, the intention has always been there to have you on. So I'm glad we're finally... We're finally doing it. So why don't you just quickly give us a layout of of yourself? How long have you been living abroad? How did you get there? Well, I've lived in San Sebastian since 2010, so almost 13 full years. Basically, I fell in love with this place, um, not just San Sebastian, but the whole Basque country, the northern part of Spain, um, when I was in college. And it kind of just got stuck in the back of my brain. And I, you know, finished my college degree in Louisiana, moved back to Birmingham, which is where I'm from, started working, started a family, but just always had it in my head. I want to go back there somehow. And so when finally, you know, figured out, because as an American, as I'm sure, you know, the difficult part is like being able to stay here legally. And so when that kind of opportunity presented itself, I convinced my then husband and my two and a half year old, let's just go try it for a year. And then it was two years and then it was three and then it was 13. So, (laughs) well, everyone always wants to know, like, how did you figure out the legal way to stay there for yourself? I mean, you know, it really was just luck because it all started when I was sitting in a coffee shop in Birmingham. I would go write um, articles or write creative stuff before I went into my kitchen job because I was a cook at this time, which is part of the reason I was so focused on San Sebastian. And um, this girl from high school walked in. I hadn't seen her in seven years. And she, I said, you know, Lauren, how are you doing? And she was like, I'm horrible. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. Because <laughs> people in Alabama are usually that honest when it comes to the niceties. <laughs> And so I was like, what happened? And she's like, well, I've been, I'm living in Spain for a year and I just got back yesterday. And I was like trying to be all empathetic, empathetic, but I was really just like, tell me how you did that. And so basically in my case, it was kind of this, um, this English teaching thing that the government does and you can get a student visa through that. And at that point, that was like the stepping stone over here. And then, um, I mean, the bureaucratic difficulties never end. I feel like it took 10 years to kind of get them under control. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It does take some dedication, certainly, if you're going to if you're going to make it happen. All right. Well, let let us paint a picture of the Basque Country for those listening who have never been there, including myself, by the way. I've been there through your book, <laughs> but in no other circumstance. Can we just do a quick like snapshot lay- layout of like, the location, the people, the food, the values. I mean, whatever it is you want to highlight of what would capture what that place is. Well, I think this is, there's so much you can say, but I think maybe start with the way that I first found out about it. I used to subscribe to Gourmet Magazine or my family did. And I remember like this one issue, I remember flipping through the pages. I think it was probably like 1999 flipping through the pages and this one article just like stopped me in my tracks. And it was this full page spread of just this dark, foggy, green, rich kind of foresty mountainous area. And it just looks so mystical and magical. And that, um, you know, these uh, huge kind of hills with dark trees and then like every now and then a little white farmhouse, a stone building um, and just looked really mysterious. And that that was an article about Asador Echevarri, which is currently the number three restaurant in the world. And so that captivated me. And really, Basque Country, really, you can kind of get the spirit from its landscape. So Basque Country is in the northern, northeastern side of Spain, just about 10 uh, minutes from the French border from Biarritz. And uh, it kind of is bordered on one side by Bilbao, where the Guggenheim, world famous Guggenheim is. Then San Sebastian is another major capital, um, and those are both cities along the coast. But you also have 
down um, to the south, you have mountains, you have the Rioja region um, is partly in Basque country. And so you kind of have this great variety of landscapes, everything from cold, wet, uh, watery to dry and um, kind of desert-like. Uh, so you have this wide variety of landscapes, which actually has provided the raw material to what has made the Basque country so famous, which is its food and its cuisine. Um, and so also uh, definitely have to point out that the Basque country is also in France as well. There's four provinces here in Spain and three in France. And why does that happen? That's like pretty weird, but it's because Basque country is one of the oldest places and one of the oldest people groups in Europe. Um, they've been around for thousands and thousands of years and their origin is still like pretty mysterious. Um, which is really cool, you know, nowadays in 2023 to still have like mystery like that. Mm -hmm. And at the same time for it to still be alive. So that's, I guess, in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and do you feel as one of the oldest people groups, do they still feel distinctly different from say other people in the further reaches of Spain or France? Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it is crazy. The difference between someone from the south of Spain, which is our typical stereotypical vision of Spain, you know, hot, sunny, siesta, bullfighting, uh, sangria, that's all down below. Up here is nothing like that. Um, the, they definitely have like a specific look towards them. So you can kind of tell what vast person when you see them, but also their character is just so different. They have tend to have like a closed off kind of character like it's a lot harder to make friends with somebody from the north from Basque country than it is from someone from the south but on the flip side of that coin they say that once you're in you're in for life and so I think part of that the the landscape which um, it's very kind of surrounded by pretty big mountains and so it's been easier to defend over the course of the millennia and they've been very isolated and they've just managed to maintain this homogenous uh, culture, language and everything, which um, has, it really does, they do feel like pretty different than other European places and, and mainstream, you know, Southern Spain. So yeah, it's really cool. And have you, after 10, 13 years, have you been let in to the, are you part of the group now? <laughs> Where do you stand? <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I think I've gotten as far as I'll ever get, that's for sure. <laughs> There's still my friends laugh when I tell them, like, I still feel like I haven't penetrated or that I'll never be fully belong, you know, but they're like, well, no, no, that's not true. But, you know, in the end, yeah, it's very much about tradition. For example, the people here, they have these things called the quadrilla. So that means like your friend group. And it's not just your friend group like we have in America where you have friends and you hang out. No, these are the people that you met when you were six, seven, eight years old, and they're the exact same people. And it doesn't matter how you end up becoming as adults or where, what you end up doing. Um, you're always kind of stuck with that same friend group. It's kind of like family. It's, mm. it's actually kind of cool in a way. It's hard to imagine as an American why you wouldn't just be optimizing and finding, you know, cooler friends that have more in common with you. But it's just kind of part of their tradition and part of their culture. Huh, that's so interesting. Well, and, and when it comes to the language, I mean, for me, I mean, you even talk about this in your book a little bit. For me, it's one of those languages that just sort of makes my mind scramble briefly. You know, it's kind of like Welsh. <laughs> when you see it written, you're like, what in the world? Uh, <laughs> and, you know, even the word like pincho in your book coming up, it's, you know, it's mm -hmm. got an X in it. And you think, well, what what are we as a English speaker supposed to do with the X that's right next to a T? Like, I don't know how to make sense <laughs> of that. <laughs> um, yeah, but I mean, yeah, but I just want to know, like, the, how would you describe the language and what has been your experience learning it, assuming that you know mm -hmm. how to speak it. Um, Basque, I know a little bit. I have not for lack of trying. I've probably dedicated about two years in total to actually studying it, but it just has not got me that far because as you mentioned, it's it's a really difficult um, um, language. I mean, just at, at first sight, you know, there, there's this abundance of T's, X's, uh, K's, Z's all kind of together. And it look, just really looks intimidating. Now, you know, I know how to pronounce it. I can kind of look at any word and say it. But the other trick to Basque um, is that it's an agglutinating language. And so the grammatical structure is nothing like Spanish, nothing like uh, Romance languages. And so there's this complex kind of verb, um, 
you know, the way that you build words and sentences is so different. So it kind of is really defeating <laughs> to try to learn it. And if that wasn't enough, um, this is a language that was only unified in the 1960s. And mm. so th there's a unified basket just that they teach in school, but you can be talking to somebody from here outside of San Sebastian, and they can try to talk to somebody from an hour and a half away to the West and they can have trouble understanding each other. Mm. And so at that point, as a learner, you're just like, why am I even doing this? I, I'm never going to be able to do this. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so how does it work in general life? Are people in the streets speaking a mix of Spanish and Basque? Are you hearing like both languages all day long or what's the reality? Yeah, I think it's um definitely just a function of how big the city that you are in is. Or really even just like um, the capitals. So Bilbao and San Sebastian, you'll hear um, probably a predominance of Spanish, especially if you're moving in the more touristy areas. But as soon as you step out of the city limits, it's like Basque all the time. And even to the extent that we spent one summer in this little village about 30, 40 minutes away from San Sebastian, and I think I spoke better Spanish than like half the people in that village. <laughs> you know, they would make these like grammatical errors and misspellings and mispronunciations that I was just like, that's not right. <laughs> but you know, they're just, they, they really do live and breathe Basque. And some of them, depending on their generation, might never have learned Spanish at all. So wow. yeah. Wow, that's so cool. I mean, there is, you capture a lot of that magical quality in your book, not just from the pictures, but just sort of like the vibe, the people you introduce us to. But you're about to like, I mean, not about, but in a year or so, you're going to be releasing a Pincho book. Can you describe what that is? What does that even mean? A Pincho is, to say it in the most simple way possible, sort of like the Basque equivalent to a tapa. Now, a tapa is different than a pincho in that tapas tend to be kind of like small plates of kind of the same thing. So like a plate of potatoes or a plate of fried fish. Whereas a pincho, the pincho started as something that was kind of like self-contained, a little snack on a toothpick, um, evolved into like a little snack on a piece of bread. So very much something that you take with your hands and eat in one or two bites. Um, they were never served free, which is what the tapas can be free. Um, so, but what happened here um, in Basque country, which is where the origin of the pincho is. And I think personally, one of the things that makes something a pincho is that it's eaten here in Basque country. The thing about the pincho is that it went over the course of the decades in the 20th century, getting more and more fancy. San Sebastian has always been a place with an extremely wealthy uh, residence and also a place with a lot of contact with France and therefore kind of like a higher level of excellence in cooking. And so the pincho went on getting fancier and fancier until they have become what they've become now, which are just like these incredibly elaborate tiny pieces of food that are just consumed in the funnest way possible. I mean, the way that they started was just the idea of people going around from wine shops at first, but then bars, so bar to bar to bar to bar, drinking, 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 having a snack, moving on. So like the rule is one pincho, one drink, move on to the next place. One pincho, one drink, move on to the next place. Pretty much the least COVID friendly way to consume <laughs> food because you're you're elbow to elbow with everyone in this bar and it's just boisterous and fun. And so I think the pincho is what it is, but it's also the experience that makes it really special. I mean, in an email that you sent to me, you said that you think that they might be the best format of eating ever invented. The yeah, you know, I do because it's like <laughs> it's so there's so many amazing things about it, right? It's like the perfect pace. It's really fun. You know, it's way more about the social aspect than it is just, you know, judging or Instagramming the food. And also it's um, in their more recent expression, it's like a way to eat really fancy food in small amounts at a very affordable price. I mean, when I first moved here, you know, there was their foie, foie gras pinchos everywhere for like three euros. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's just, it's just like paradise in that <laughs> sense. And, and just being able to try a lot of different things that were the course of a meal. I, I just think, yeah, it's the best. <laughs> yeah. Well, and like if you're going one pincho to one drink, are these, is it really just like one bite or are some of them kind of bigger, like pushing the limit of uh, what you would think of as a, just a taste of something? 
Yeah, I mean, they, they can get bigger. And you, that's another funny thing. Like in San Sebastian, they're very exquisite and tend to be kind of these perfect, perfect little pieces of food. But if you go out of out of here or to, you know, Victoria or Bilbao, the other capitals, they are bigger in size and like more about like less fun, less like fancy and more about like soaking up the alcohol because that's how they started. They were something that people would eat to soak up the large amounts of alcohol that mm-hmm. they would intake. Katie, with a quick aside, stay tuned to the end of this conversation and find out how you can make a pincho of your very own for your friends this week. Quick offer, though. A delightful offer, really. We're taking Bittersweet Life listeners to Rome this October of 2023. From October 8th to the 14th, to be exact, it's going to be a magical week of private tours to special historic sites. Places that even some Romans have never seen before. You'll also have a chance to get to know Tiffany and I personally and see how the podcast is created behind the scenes. To make it extra special, we are limiting space to just 10 rooms in the most amazing convent-turned-hotel that you've ever seen. We can send you all of the details. I can send it to you today. Just send an email to bittersweetlifepodcast at gmail.com, letting us know that you're interested in the trip to Rome this October. And don't be shy. If you're coming to this episode a little later than when it came out, and you think to yourself, they can't possibly have any rooms left, I'm already too late. Just send us a note, write to us. There might be a room remaining that is your room. It has your name on it. So write us. And if we don't have any rooms left, we are putting together a backup list just in case someone needs to drop out. So there's nothing to fear by sending a note. This will be, I promise, a -a once-in-a-lifetime exploration of one of the most amazing cities in Europe. You will see wondrous, beautiful, amazingly historic art, architecture, and sites. I hope you come with us. October 8th to the 14th, 2023. A delightful thing to look forward to. Send us an email. Bittersweetlifepodcast at gmail.com. Now back to the show. Sometimes when I, before I do an interview, especially with someone that I've been going back and forth talking with for so many years, I'll, I, like I asked you, I'll say, well, what, what have you been thinking about? Yeah, yes, the Basque Country book came out, you know, years and years ago, but what have you been thinking about now? And you sent me a great and varied list of a whole bunch of different things that you've been thinking about. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I loved like so many of the things that you put on the list that I thought we should almost try to do some sort of a, like a lightning round and like touch on each one of these <laughs> things before we're, we're out of time. I don't think we're going to get to everything, okay. but I did want to do uh, a few of them anyway. So one of them that you wrote down was Spanish life versus American life, which is a massive topic, one that we could do an entire episode about. But what are some of your thoughts about the main differences, I guess, between life there and life where I am over here in Seattle? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's when you say there's so many, we could do a whole episode. It's so true. And in fact, there are like people on Instagram, expats like me, whose whole shtick is like pointing out the silly differences because it's just everything. I was talking to my friend last night about how um, here they you tend to not get introduced if you run into people while you're with your friends they will not introduce you. And as an American, that makes me feel so awkward because the first thing you do when you run into, so you're like, oh, this is my friend so-and-so, right? So those are, but there's so many small differences like that. But honestly, the first thing and like also the thing that I really want people to know is just what happened to me. Like when I first moved over here, it was insane. I did not expect this. It was like within a week of moving over here, just realizing, you know, you wake up in the middle of the night because you've heard a sound and you have this fear, like, is somebody breaking into my house? And that here just, like, does not exist. So there's, like, no violent crime or almost no violent crime. There's no guns. There's no constant fear of what's going to happen at school or in public or at an event, you know? And that is, like, pretty priceless. Um, and then also, like, I just didn't even realize I was walking around America with these weights on my shoulders, but here, of course, there's like the great European health system, in this case, the Spanish public health system, and even more specifically, the Basque country, which is one of the best in Spain. 
and you go to the office, you get a little card with your name on it and you never pay for anything again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, yeah. You know, and it's, it's like my, my mom came over when I gave birth to my second daughter, she managed to find fault because the hospital wasn't air conditioned, <laughs> <laughs> you know, she's like socialist medicine. And I'm like giving birth like for free, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. you know? So, so, but just that, that relief, um, mm-hmm. just, I wish that I could like give people that feeling so that they would like take to the streets and push for change in America because those things I feel like are basic human rights and here having them is just so cool. But then, you know, there's just like the more lighthearted stuff, which is like the time and um, the time of day that you eat meals and the way that you eat. That was also something that really changed my life for the better. Like just giving yourself permission to take a long time preparing and eating your food, you know, like not feeling like lunch has to be rushed at your desk because you're losing time working like, you know, being able to take that leisurely time, having people be like, why do you need your coffee to go? Like sit down and drink your coffee like a normal person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I just feel like that speaks to a just a greater um, outlook in life, which is like, we're here to live life. We're not here to be especially productive. We're not here because of our jobs. We are not defined by our jobs. That's another thing that I notice here, which is like, people co-mingle like um not based on their job or you know it's like more based on where, where you grew up or you, you know your neighbors like you'll hang out with I just remember this one example very vividly which was this lady that I knew um she was hanging out with some other people I knew who I don't know professionals marketing whatever and later somebody told me yeah she like stocks yogurt at the grocery store and I was just like wow you know that is such a different sphere But yet these people come together and have drinks or have a glass of wine together and it's like normal. And um, I just felt like that's kind of the way that they don't really define themselves by their jobs is also kind of part of this bigger picture of just like a low stress lifestyle. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's honestly my favorite, favorite thing living here has been learning to slow down a little bit. And have you found that that you as a person who grew up in America, have you been able to find that? you can live that way that you do that you don't worry about what you do for a living (laughs) no but it has turned the volume down a lot you know like I go I will go unfortunately and sorry to anybody who's emailed me I will go like a week without answering an email or maybe even a month and not really feel any sort of (laughs) guilt I um I still have you know that like lots of aspirations and that's actually something I really like about America is just this idea of like you have an idea, like go for it. You have a goal or a dream, go for it. I still, I still like that, but I, I definitely, I'm definitely the same with me as a person. Now I don't feel really like I fit in in the United States, and I definitely don't fit in fully here. So I'm just in this middle ground. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. That's a, it. Happens a lot. People going anywhere, really. I think you always are a little bit displaced, regardless of what country you end up in. Okay, so one of your other topics is about parenting, single parenting abroad challenges there, or like, I mean, so you're single parenting two children living abroad. Yeah. And I mean, what has that been like? (laughs) It's, uh, yeah, it's, um, my, my case is a little kind of strange because my older daughter is 15 and my younger one is three. And so in that way, I have, you know, a lot of help from the older one to help me with the three-year-old. But yeah, it's it's tough here more than being a single parent. It's like I, as an American or as a person from Alabama, am on like the wrong schedule. <laughs> I had my first daughter when I was 23. I got married when I was 22. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I had my first daughter when I was 23. Um, I separated from my husband, I guess, when I was almost 30, around there somewhere, 31. And so at that age here in Spain, people are famously late emancipating, getting out of their parents' house. So at that point, I'm still having friends who are still living with their parents, not even talking about marriage or babies. Mm -hmm. And so now at my ripe old age of 38, like some (laughs) of my friends are just now starting to have their first baby. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just like on this accelerated track, which means 
um, not having as much, you know, the societal support or like mommy groups. I just remember feeling as a 26 year old taking my daughter to school here, like so young compared to the parents that were also taking their kids to school because the generation um, generational markers in Spain are very different as well because they were under a dictatorship until the late seventies. And so um, they definitely took a long time to like come around to modern life. Mm-hmm. So the, so they, you know, felt, I felt just totally different than them. And I guess that's been the hardest part. Being a single mom is always a challenge, but I did read the other day a, a study that probably is circulating about how um, single moms feel like they are, they have like a 20% less like home housework load because of their lack of a husband. <laughs> so, so that was kind of thinking, I was like, okay, maybe, maybe I have actually less work as a single mom. <laughs> So you move when you moved abroad to Spain, you were still married. So is your your is that husband is he still around? I mean, that's the other tricky thing is how do you uh, keep a child in a different country if the other person wants to go back? Yeah, it's it's so complicated, and it is just um, I don't know. It's it's fortunately fortunately for my daughter and for how things have turned out, he ended up living in a different part of Spain. So that makes, you know, visits and such a lot easier, but I just, I do not recommend, (laughs) you know, doing that. (laughs) No, it's really, 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 really tough being a fish out of water and trying to navigate like legal processes. It's, it's really, it's, it was, it was like the, that was all happening right when I was writing the Basque uh, Basque country, my first cookbook. And it was, it was tough. It was pretty much um, like a, kind of trial through fire or whatever they say kind mm-hmm. of moment of my life <laughs> yeah, yeah I bet but now if, so with the the little one that was born right before COVID began what is your outlook or hope as her parent see here she is now born in country this is going to be uh you know Spain will be her origin story you know what is your yeah. hope or what do you think about that I just don't know I don't know what to think because it is when I look at my daughters, you know, the older one is trilingual. Um, she's born in America and her parents are both American, but she feels very San Sebastian, very Basque. And you look at a kid like that and you're like, what? You are so lucky. <laughs> Do you know how lucky you are? <laughs> and I can always tell her, I'm like, I didn't stay in a hotel till I was like 18. I didn't get on a plane till I was, you know, around that age as well. And she's like jet setted, you know, well, budget <laughs> flights, not <laughs> yeah. jet setting, but, you know, but cheap European flights all over Spain and Europe. And you just look at somebody like that and also like at my three-year-old who will eventually also speak three languages and her father's Peruvian, I'm American. So they're just like these children of the world. And you're like, you guys could literally do anything. You know, you, it's hard to just tell, look at them and tell them that. And they don't really believe you, but you're like, you already are like so far ahead in certain ways that can lead to, you know, really cool experiences than kids that have stayed in the same place their whole life and are monolingual. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know what to do besides just like sit back and watch and be there to support them, you know, because I'm like in awe of what doors could open for them. Yeah, that's great. All right. I think we got time for one more. Um, And so your book, the one I have, Basque Country, the one that exists in the world that you listening could go out and get today. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. The book has, I mean, it is a cookbook, but it's also, uh, it, it talks a lot about Basque life and it's, um, it has a warmth to it. It makes it look like it has a warmth and simplicity like and tradition. It almost feels like you're peering in at a different period of time, you know, even though it is our modern world. But that's the experience of looking at your book is like, and maybe from what it sounds like from you, what it feels like to live there to a certain degree. Uh, but however, tourism comes into play uh, anywhere that's delightfully charming. What is your take on how tourism affects places? Yeah, I talk about this all the time with um, fellow expats, with residents, even with you know politicians around town and stuff. And it's really tough because I've seen in the 13 years I've been here so much change in San Sebastian based around the amount of tourists that have flooded in. Um, because tourism really only picked up here um, in this century 
after the political Basque separatism problems sort of died down, um, which was really only officially like 2012, 2013. So tourism has skyrocketed and there has definitely been an effect on the Pincho, the tradition of the Pincho. In the old town of San Sebastian, there's this general sense from the locals that they have been displaced. Mm -hmm. And as it has like gotten more and more crowded with foreigners, it feels like the locals have been like, I don't belong there anymore. And so their kind of migratory eating patterns, <laughs> as if they were a flock of birds, have <laughs> moved um, kind of into their neighborhoods and out of the center, sort of leaving this kind of fake. It's not all the way there yet, but it definitely feels like it's changed a lot, leaving like this kind of um, window shop or like display of what it once was. And it's actually a topic that I'm exploring right now because I'm going to go speak at a food conference in the summer about it and really talk about how kind of like the foreigners gaze has prompted people here to sort of panic and be like, okay, let's decide what a pincho really is so that people can't like make bad ones and ruin our reputation. But at the same time, if you have to start doing that, like maybe it's already been changed irreparably, irreparably. Mm. And so honestly, it's really hard because I know I'm part of the problem. I mean, I travel around. I am a tourist as well. Um, I, but I think it, if you're coming here and if you are a tourist, like the best thing you can do is to just be curious, be respectful. There's tourists that walk around and like put out their I'm a British person energy or I'm a French person and like take up space with that. And then there's tourists which often are the American tourists who are just so thir thirsty to learn and so like good spirited. Um, at least that's the experience I've had seeing American tourists around here. I think mm. this place is special because it's a little bit still off the beaten track and the people who want to come want to come to eat and people who love to eat tend to be awesome people. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that is always the big, the big part of the question when you, you move somewhere that you, that idea of you being a part of the problem that you are, a person who is living in the center when maybe other people cannot anymore. How do you think about that? I mean, you're obviously like spending a lot of your time going out and trying to like amplify and learn about the original culture. There's no question about that. Yeah, yeah I know. I How do I reconcile it? Well, on one hand, I reconcile it because <laughs> there it is like impossible to pay to like survive. <laughs> San Sebastian is like the most expensive city in Spain. Um, the average rent here, I think, is like fourteen or fifteen hundred, whereas the average salary in Spain is like fifteen hundred. Mm. So you can just kind of see how. Um, I mean, per per square meter, it's always the most expensive city in Spain. Um, so I work really hard to be able to live where I live, you know, and you know, all the people that are from here um, kind of have the route paved for them, you know, inheritance or their parents help them out with the house or whatever, which is fine, but that's kind of how they keep the, they keep it in the family a little bit. And then like, as far as what I do, you know, I try to, I don't, I almost never give like Pincho tours. Um, it's like, you know, uh, Steven Spielberg writes me and he's like, please take me around. And I'm like, yes, but <laughs> I don't know why I thought of him, but, but if, um, you know, I get asked for that and I don't like to kind of do that kind of this is a zoo and I'm going to take you around to look at the animals. Mm -hmm. Like I do what I do do. And I hope that this is like compensating for any damage I might be causing is what you said, like try to be really rigorous and like get to the bottom of these really cool things that sometimes the best people don't even realize that what they have or what, that it's cool. You know, like my book that I wrote doesn't exist in Spanish or Basque a book that captures all of the classic recipes, a book that really tests them and wrote them out, a book that talks about the context at the same time. Like it got it got translated to Spanish because it doesn't exist in Spanish. And so in that way, you know, just trying to maintain like ethics around what I do and be like a little bit more rigorous and a little less superficial. So that's that's like, that's my logic. That's good. I don't know if it's right or not, but... Well, if you want to check out the book, it is called Basque Country, A Culinary Journey Through a Food Lover's Paradise by Marty Buckley. Thanks for coming on to the show. I really appreciate it. 
is yeah, this might be an imp- having me. oh of course and this might be an impossible ending question but since most <laughs> of us listening are probably not currently in the Basque country is there one thing that we could do today that would resemble the lifestyle there wherever we are <laughs> oh my god i love that question nobody has ever asked me that before um yes definitely um what i would do if i were you is i would like clear my schedule um on a saturday and I would go down to the farmer's market and there's a couple of dishes in my cookbook that I think turn out almost even better, like when you make them in the States than when you make them here because of the produce. So I would pick up some items for those dishes. So like one, two of them that I love are like the shrimp brochette, which is shrimp and bacon on a stick with this delicious pepper vinaigrette. It's a pincho. And the other one is like a potato chorizo stew. And that can be like your main dish. So go shopping for those ingredients at the market, have a coffee, sit down and drink your coffee, people. (laughs) (laughs) And then you invite all your friends over, um, pop open a bottle of Rioja or Chacoli, the Basque white wine, if you're more of a white person, make sure you invite lots of friends because that's the most important part. Put on some really cool um, Basque music. There's a singer I love called Idoya, um, or you can go the folkloric route. Um, just take two or three hours to eat your meal and don't hurry it. And then when you're finished, offer everybody coffee and make obligate everyone to drink a gin and tonic and sit around the table and talk. And here that takes that whole thing that I just told you takes like nine hours. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's how long you should be doing that. (laughs) So, so when do, when should you invite people over? If you want to be traditional, if you're going to go the full nine hours. Well, you could, they should come at one or so. Okay. Or you could invite them, you could invite them to like on the market journey as well, because sometimes that's what people do, or they'll like meet up for their first drink after they've gone to the market and then um, continue on for the food. That's great. Yeah. That's so great. (laughs) All right. I love that plan. And uh, I don't know, should I put one of those recipes? If I was going to take a photo and email them to the people who request the recipe, which one of mm-hmm. those two would you suggest I do? Which is the uh, the stew? Do or the do pincho? the pincho just because it's like a little more you know just emblematic. Like you can have like a tray of them; they'll be like showstoppers. Okay. And also, the color the color of the vinaigrette is a color of the Basque flag, which is red, white, and green. So very nice. All right. So if you send me an email to bittersweetlifepodcast at gmail.com. I will send you a photograph of that recipe if you want to try that. With the with the author's permission. With, she has permission. Yeah, to send it. I know. With the author's permission because I'm asking her live uh, if she'll do this. <laughs> but you really should go out and uh, explore getting this full book on your own. Well, thank you, Marty. That was so great. And if you do find yourself in Seattle with the next book, I hope you'll come back on. I definitely would love to. I'll be there. All right. And until next time, this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Kitty Sewell. We'll talk to you next week. Bye.